Uh, I think in, in the past, communications teams have been bogged down by what leaders and what uh, you know captains of their organisation thought they wanted them to do. Uh, and I think COVID's been a big turning point in that, in, in those captains of industry and government seeing what good communications looks like. And, uh, and having seen that, I think a lot of us are now back at that table. So I can give my team much better context as to what's happening and giving them the space and the ability to not get bogged down by the unnecessary work, but stay focused on the high value work. And as long as I'm giving them that space uh, to do that, then they can, they can do what they need to do. Before First Light, we had people that were queued out. Uh, before, before doors opened, they were queuing because everyone thought, well, I'm going to have to get down here to get some, get some sort of help from, from the government. So they were, they were queued up right around Australia, snaking down streets. Not only was that, you know, we're in a pandemic. And so, you know, people out in the streets and mixing with each other, you had the, you had the health concerns with it, but then you just had the, the operational concerns for us as well and, uh, and what came with that. Welcome to the GovComs podcast, bringing you the latest insights and innovations from experts and thought leaders around the globe in government communication. Now, here is your host, David Pembroke. Hello, everyone, and welcome once again to GovComs, the podcast about the practice of communication in government and the public sector. My name is David Pembroke. Thanks for joining me. Today, a conversation with an old friend and colleague, someone who I've known for many years, probably more years than we would both like to imagine. But Bevan Hannon is the General Manager of Communications at Services Australia. And for our friends from overseas, Services Australia is the big service delivery arm of the Australian government. And they really drive a lot of that service delivery across a whole range of things. And we'll get to that with Bevan. Um, through our conversation today. But Bevo has been in the business for quite some time, about 35 years, starting as a newspaper journalist, but then went on to work as the media manager for the Canberra Raiders and also has been not only a sports reporter, but a sports commentator for ABC Radio. But he moved into the Australian Public Service in 2002, first in politics but then moving into the bureaucracy where he has worked in a number uh, of very, very important projects. And one of them in particular was the Bali bombings uh, and also some other natural disaster. And we'll come to that conversation um, as we get to talking to Bevan. But certainly as the general manager of communications, Australia has had a range of challenges over the last sort of five or so years uh, with the pandemic, with fires and with floods. And Bevan has been right at the heart of it in his role as General Manager of Communications, keeping the Australian people informed. But he joins me in the studio. Bevan Hannon, welcome to GovComs. Thanks, Pemby. It's great to be here. I'm really looking forward to this. So listen, mate, um, let's go back. Let's go to the beginning of the story. Uh, It's a fairly common sort of pathway, isn't it, via journalism, media, into Gov comms. But what's the, the backstory before then? Where, where did Bevan Hannon grow up? Born and bred in Canberra, Pemby. And uh, I actually started really young. So, so my, my journey in communication started as a hobby when I was 12 years old. And it all started where um, I had a love of sport, played whatever sport I could, um, uh, couldn't get enough of it. But on Saturday mornings, there was a radio show, local radio show, and I used to ring up and win all the quizzes. <laughs> and so the host said to me, uh, you need to come in. We need to meet you. And so that gentleman was uh, a guy by the name of Lee Donnelly, who's no longer with us. He was a, a rugby league uh, administrator and publicist in uh, in Canberra. And uh, he um, he had a radio show and got me in, and that was my start. He, uh, he made me a part of that show, and I started doing – uh, interviews and producing content uh, from from that age, from early high school, and uh, and that opened uh, many doors for me. Um, uh, I was very fortunate as a teenager to have um, uh, plenty of good men who uh, who mentored me and saw potential and uh, and guided me the right way. So um, so so from that, um, I was writing for the Canberra Times as a hobby on weekends um, uh, for magazines. Um, and uh, that led to, I think I was still in year 12 of my old footy club. Uh, there was a guy by the name of Ian Henry. His uh, son, Neil, was a professional rugby league coach. He was the fa- founding father of our junior footy club, and he offered me a, a role while I was still in year 12 as a sports administrator. 
And so then I got experience organising tournaments and sportsman's nights with the likes of Peter Sterling and Johnny Raper and um, some wonderful opportunities at a, at a very young age. But uh, um, apart from my dad, who was a, um, who was a butcher and a single dad and who um, did a lot to make sure that those doors that were opening, that, that I'd made the most of them, uh, he had a great work ethic and uh, he encouraged me immensely. There was a gentleman by the name of Brad Turner who was a journalist uh, and in recent years he's been a lecturer and shooter in Brisbane um, for the next um, the next cohort of, of uh, journalists coming through and uh, and he spotted something in me and he got me a cadetship at the Canberra Times and uh, uh, bottom line was I finished my uh, cadetship and he put the polish on me from a hobbyist to a professional and uh, and by the time I was uh, still 19 I was a greater journalist mm. and uh, so I had a head start on others my contemporaries were still at uni toughing it out at uni and uh, and I'd, I'd sort of got out of the blocks but it was all a res- result of that uh, mentorship I had from a, a lot of good people in my early years and uh, um, yeah it certainly put me on a good footing. What are your memories of, of the lessons that you learned from those earliest days that you still rely on today to, to not only lead the team that you do at Services Australia and as I say we'll get to that because it's a very large team but what what are the lessons that stay with you to this day as the things that are at the essence of effective communication? Yeah, there's, there's a lot of things that, like, like in those early years, I mean, I was able to make mistakes on public radio and things like that in putting content together, and uh, <laughs> uh, you know, the, the mistakes that you're not making in, in the full glare of a professional career. So, yeah. so, 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 all of that. But, it, but look, it gave me opportunity. I was building building networks at a, at a very young age, and, uh, and and because rugby league was my specialty, and that was sort of my that was probably the, my the passion for my sport. When I became uh, um, a journalist at the Canberra Times, um, that coincided with the with the Raiders Canberra Raiders golden era. They won three premierships in five years, and uh, and so my expertise was was rugby league, and they needed rugby league experts. And so um, uh, and so for me, you know, I'd been interviewing Wayne Bennett, Mal Meninga, Laurie Daly, and Bradley Clyde, you know, two superstars of the game when they before they got into into the top team. So I'd, I'd Built all these relationships um, uh, well before um, I actually became a became a journalist, a fully fledged journalist, and uh, uh, and that certainly yeah uh, that that set things up. And by the time I was twenty three, I was a chief rugby league writer, and uh, and that was in nineteen ninety four when they won their last premiership. Um, and uh, yeah, I had the privilege of being able to to work with that group and culminating going on a kangaroo tour um the last the last proper kangaroo tour of great britain in france end of 94 um and some yeah wonderful memories and experiences and probably when, when, you, when you talk about your the lessons learned and what you take away one of the um the most influential people on me in those early years was a uh, was a coach by the name of tim sheens um he was so generous in his time to me about teaching me the game but also what I learned from him as being a professional and uh, everything from um, work ethic to preparation to how you treat people to mixing things up and changing things up. I think in 94, I remember he surprised everyone by, I'd never seen him with it before, but he had a beard that year. He never looked like that before. So he was always doing things to, to, to make things different or to innovate, and, uh, but also to have fun under that pressure. Um, he knew um, he put really good people around him, himself um, and people who could also inject some fun into the pressure that they were under in that professional sporting environment. And uh, um, I was fortunate to be able to work um, with him as a as a journalist, but then I later worked with the club and worked alongside him and I even learned even more. So I was very, very fortunate to get access to some uh, elite people in their craft. And uh, yeah, it has certainly served me well for my career. The key word to me in a lot of that is relationships. You mentioned that from a young age that you learnt the importance of getting to know people and building relationships. Uh, communications is a people business, isn't it? And and it sits at the heart of it is is relationships. So, in your leadership out at um, Services Australia, how do you encourage? Um, the younger people in your teams to understand about the importance of relationships, and indeed, you know, a second part to the question is about how do you build relationships in an environment that is no longer as it used to be, and we now work remotely, we don't work side by side, uh, we're not in the same buildings often as the people who we need to build relationships with. So what advice and how do you guide your teams at the moment to build those relationships upon which effective communications has to be built? 
It's central to it, Pemby. It's it's totally central, and it's uh, it's it's taking an interest in your team and leading by example on that. And um, I definitely hope that uh, um, the way I've led my teams throughout my career, I, I sort of see things which the, the the leaders of those teams now do, which are which are lasting. And uh, and it all comes down to having uh, an interest in your people, um, encouraging them. And so, like we've got a we've got a fabulous team out there. I mean, we've got about two hundred people across a range of disciplines. So real experts in what they do, everything from production and editing through to designers, through to you know, websites and web design and information architects, uh, through to um, media professionals. And it's about getting out of their way. You know, it really is giving them the context for what they need to do. Uh, I think in in the past. Communications teams have been bogged down by what leaders and what uh, you know captains of their organisation thought they wanted them to do, uh, and I think COVID's been a big turning point in that. In in those captains of industry and government seeing what good communications looks like, and uh, and having seen that, I think a lot of us are now back at that table. So I can give my team much better context as to what's happening and giving them the space and the ability to not get big, uh, bogged down by the unnecessary work but stay focused on the high value work and as long as I'm giving them that space uh, to do that then they can they can do what they need to do but you can't do that as individuals you can't do anything especially in a in an organization as big as ours because um, it's not just our organization you're working across government and sometimes across layers of government you've got to do it as a team and you've got to collaborate you've got to consult and so um, so that, that's a it's a number one expectation and and you talk about you um, uh, the hybrid working arrangements now, like, um, yes, that's part of what we're doing going forward. But the, the last thing I want is to have junior staff members coming through and sitting on the floor by themselves and not having someone there to hear that they might be having a hard conversation and not having someone to pull them out of a hole. So so there's still that responsibility for the culture of the place and for the culture of your team uh, to be supportive and be in there in person as well to strike that balance. So how are you going to do that? That's an interesting question, isn't it? When you reflect on your your history, your backstory, it's it, it was about mentors. It was about people tapping you on the shoulder every so often and saying, not that way, Bevo, this way, or you being able to take ideas to them and say, I'm thinking this, and then, then be able to sit with you and have that time. So how are you going to maintain that type of environment and relationship in a distributed workforce? Yeah, look, and we're fortunate. We've, we've had a bit of a head start on all that because um, we're not just a um, uh, in the one building uh, in here in Canberra, like our our communications teams have always been spread. We've always had people spread across all states and territories in most capital cities. Yeah. And so we've always had to work hybrid anyway, where you're not necessarily all around each other. And so um, so we, we've, we've, come a, we've come a long way in establishing how you maintain those relationships and maintain those connections um, uh, while being apart. But there, there has to be those times as well um, that you come together and certainly core teams come together. But um, it's it's discipline and consistency, Pemby. Like I'll, I'll give an example from COVID and it's coming from uh, our former CEO, Rebecca Skinner. Um, but, but during COVID, one of the things that she did um, and our team helped her with was uh, she wrote to, to people on a daily basis. Every day she wrote, staff. wrote to staff, all staff on a daily basis. Here's the latest. Things were changing quickly, and there was just a need to keep people up to speed on you know what's next. And uh, you know, we were one of the organisations where, particularly our frontline staff, um, they were they were in there every day. There was no working from home for a lot of them. You know, <laughs> yeah. we, we were our service centres were open every day uh, um, of a business day during the pandemic. Uh, so um, you know, there was a lot of uncertainty with, with, no, with all people of, lying down around the corners, and you know, a lot of anxiety that those people had to deal with. Yeah, and I can tell you a story about that um, uh, after I finish this one. But but she didn't find out until after the the pandemic that one of the the, the frontline staff said to her, uh, Rebecca, that was such a tough time. We didn't know what was happening. I didn't know what was happening in my life. The only thing that I had was certain was your email every day. Yeah, wow. And that's the power of communication. Yeah. So tell me that story about down around the corner and everybody and the you know the challenges of those services Australia staff and what role you could play to to support them to deliver for people who were very anxious and very nervous and overwhelmed in many ways. Yeah. Look, it was a. Um, this this underlines the in-house capability that that we've got in our agency, and um, 
I think it was around 20th of March was, was yeah, the time. It, it was, was 20th of March. And it was, a, it was it was a Sunday night. Yep. When and it was about nine o'clock at night, and that's when the Prime Minister was was on the telly and basically it was it was pretty clear things were locking down. He closed the closed the country. Yeah. Yep. And uh before first light, we had people that were queued out. Uh before before doors opened, they were queuing because they everyone thought, well, I'm gonna have to get down here to get some get some sort of help from from the government. And so they were they were queued up right around Australia, snaking down streets. And uh not only was that um well primarily we were in the you know, we're in a pandemic. And so, you know, people out in the streets and mixing with each other, you had the you had the health yeah. concerns with it, but then you just had the the operational concerns for us as well and uh, and what came with that. And there was no reason for people to be there. They just thought this is what I'm gonna have to do. Um so we had to get rid of those queues. Um and we did that in a couple of days. And uh, and it was all done in-house. There was no outside help provided. There was no crisis um, consultants brought in or anything. It was all, all done in-house. And uh, and the key to it was was this, and it was a, a combination of technology and then what we could do with uh, with communications. And um, um, what we did was um, the, the, the tech side of the house came up with an intent to claim form. So basically, as we're, we're working out what people might be able to... Um, uh, support from the government, put in this intent to claim form, and then we'll come back to you. So no reason to come in at all. But we need to get that up and running. We're one of the um, agencies in government in here in Australia where we've got a spokesperson, a primary spokesperson in Hank Yongan, a, a real giant of government communications, <laughs> um, uh, who gave me my opportunity in um, in the federal public service. And yeah. uh, he's a great educator. He's very good at distilling difficult messages and uh, he's and media love working with him because he's a he's a terrific communicator. And uh, and so so we had him out giving the messages that that we that people needed to hear about, you know, what we prefer them to do um, and how they can best access help. But we're talking about a technological fix here. And he was doing wall-to-wall media, you know, all the breakfast TVs and radios and whatever else. And I had a support person with him and and I was testing the tech in the morning. I wanted to make sure that it was released overnight. Is this thing working? We tested it and double tested it. And uh, and we had him set up to go. And so he was live on a uh, national radio broadcast, uh, live radio interview. And, and he knew um, from the preparation we'd done overnight in that morning, his messaging was going to change when we knew this intent to claim uh, online intent to claim process was was ready to rock, and uh, he was midstream interview, and uh, I sent the message to um, his minder, and uh, bang, they had put up the green as go card, and he changed his messaging like that, and uh, within an hour there were a hundred thousand people had um, put in intent to claims. So I was a hundred thousand people less who weren't going to be queued outside of our wow. our doors, and they disappeared. All done, as I say, in house, and it was a real. Um, that was it. Set the tone for, for how our agency and, and our communications team handled it for, for the for the next few years. You mentioned the great Hank Yongan, and he is generally he is a great um, of of government communications. You know, really globally, I think he set the standard as someone not, who not only um, led the development of comms internally, but the, in this role of spokesperson. How important is it that? that government has spokespeople who are not ministers or assistant ministers or, or government members, not politicians? Look, I think it's really important, Pemby, certainly in, in service delivery, which we're in, you know, like because you can't expect a minister to be across the detail and the, the range of payments and programs that we deliver. Yeah. You know, like it's $200 billion or something we, we outlay payments, 500 million claims a year across multiple, multiple programs. Um and down to emergencies, and uh, you just don't need your ministers down in those weeds. There's a role for ministers, but there's also uh, a role for the bureaucracy to be able to um, have a trusted face who can uh, communicate what people need to do. And Hank has certainly built that up over a over a long period of time. And um, you know, like when he first, uh, I remember when he first um, started doing a lot of this, uh, um, the, the live broadcast media, he. He, um, he was on Sunrise, he was on live. It was back in the days when Sunrise still had tyres on. And I think Koshy hadn't been there that long, David Kosh. And um, he put a question on Hank, which was, um, you know, what do people do if they're lost in the system? And, and Hank started saying, well, here's all the, all the ways you can reach us through our hundreds of service centres and whatever else. And Koshy said to him, well, but what if they're still lost in the system? What do they do? And I could see Hank, the... The old eyeballs were, were moving and the, and the brain was cranking and he, he couldn't remember the customer relations unit number. He couldn't remember it. And he just said, 
email me. And on national TV live, he gave out his email address. And uh, and so we got a few emails in the next couple of days. But that that served as a yeah. as a prototype because we don't have advertising as a, we don't we don't do campaigns, and so we do rely on our on media partners to 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 help educate the community on, on important messaging. And uh, and so and that's been part of it since then. We obviously changed the email address, but whenever he goes out, there is a uh, an option where um, if someone is lost in the system, that they can email. Uh, email a, a version of Hank, <laughs> uh, and uh, and he will make sure it's part of it's part of what he does. He makes sure that it's followed through, yeah. and um, uh, yeah. So look, it's really important part of a part of building that that trust, and uh, um, yeah, it's 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 fundamental to, to to how we do our operation. Now, before we get into sort of the the day to day at the moment, and as you say, the capability, which I think is very impressive and been developed over a long period of time, I just want to take you back to that transition. So you're working in rugby league, knowing rugby league. Um, working with the best in sport, uh, as you say, one of the great teams with many great athletes, great coach in Tim Sheens, uh, a kangaroo tour would have been a highlight for you. Then you decided to go to government and obviously politics was first, but then into the APS. So just take us back and tell us through the, what was the thinking of walking away from sport and walking towards government? Yeah, there were, there were two te- stepping stones in that, PMB. The, fir- the first was... When I finished journalism, uh, well, you know, it was sort of towards the back end of '95. The biggest story that I'd covered was Super League, uh, where there oh, was yeah. a, a big split in the game. And so, um, uh, and it was at the end of that time, uh, the all the Super League clubs uh, in going professional. One of the decisions they made was to get media managers on. They all, been for the first time, had uh, set a media manager. So I was um, offered an opportunity to, to go and make the jump from journalism to to be the Raiders media manager, which is what I did. So I had that couple of years uh, doing that right through the real difficult part of the of the Super League war, and um, um, you know it wasn't a, a great place for the game, and it, it was uh, you know it was a real it was a long way back from there f- for the game. And what did you take from that as a as a communications professional? You know, you've come across from journalism, but. That was, a, and for, again, for people from overseas, one of the main uh, sporting codes in Australia uh, split. And so we had two competitions and they were both competing against each other and uh, Rupert Murdoch on one side, Kerry Packer on the other and lots of money involved, but very hostile. Um, it really split the community as well, the, the, the people following the game. So as the communications manager of the Raiders at that time, what, what again, lessons did you, did you take from that time? Yeah. See, see, I've been sort of doing writing as such, you know, uh, whether it was in my pre camper times days when I was a kid as a hobby or, or, or actually as a professional, but it had been a dozen years and I was ready to expand and do something else. And right. having covered it, look, I knew there was a split, but I knew, I knew that, Whatever came of this, I would learn something. I knew it was going to be worthwhile, and, and I did. Uh, it was, you know, from that there was a huge amount of money involved in this uh, in this thing, and a huge amount of money was wasted. But um, you know, seeing some of the the crisis consultants that were involved, seeing some of the the high level sponsorship partnerships they had with the likes of Nike, and just sort of seeing that, you know, up close, some of that professionalism that was that was that was great. And from a club point of view, you had stakeholders like boards to manage and sponsors, and you're doing that in a very difficult issues environment because, as you say, it was on the nose. Um, so you know, so, so there were a uh, yeah a lot of um, you know there were a lot of good things you know as a uh, it can't all be rainbows and lollipops, and so you know it taught me some, you know what it's like to be at the lowest and uh, and the, and the types of things you're up against. So so that was really beneficial. Probably you know the next thing that was important for me before going into the into the Australian public service was uh, I had three or four years um, working in the ACT Parliament. So and so the connection goes back to rugby league as well. One of the players I formed a relationship with. Um, uh, during that time was Paul Osborne. And when he retired after 1994, he became an independent member of the um, ACT Assembly. And in his second term, uh, at the start of 98, he had another um, candidate uh, on his ticket um, got elected as well. And so and he, he, he called me up and said, you want to give us a hand? At the time, I'd... Um, uh, I'd seen quite a lot, uh, having grown up loving sport and then being in the Super League in the thick of that. Um, the game was going professional. There was a lot of money and I saw a lot of opportunists hanging around the players um, at that time. And it just didn't sit right with me and it made me take stock of my career. And okay. so I was actually contemplating going to uni full time to, to do my next thing. And then this came up. And um, Aussie's running mate was a, an ex-policeman, Dave Rubendike, a lovely soul of the earth fellow. And um, I said, yeah, I want to give this a crack. And um, what I learned from that 
was apart from the you know the relationships relationship side of things on the political side of the fence, which I'll come to in a second, but the process of government, what I learned about. The independents that I was working with, they'd balance power. So nothing got through that assembly without them voting for it. So as a staffer, and you didn't have a lot of it was a, it was a very it was all your rag stuff. Um, there wasn't a lot of support there, and so you had to be across everything, and you know down to I remember drafting uh, bills and explanatory memoranda, you know, for uh, legislation <laughs> that ultimately passed, and, and doing it with obviously help from parliamentary council. But you know you had to be across the process. So it taught me intimately about. The processes of, of government and committees and how, how it all works. Um, so that was, an, that was an important grounding. And plus it showed me as well the interplay between bureaucracy and, and ministers and politicians, but also the pressures that um, staff are under and particularly ministerial staff. So there you have it, the end of part one of our conversation with Bevan Hannan and really some great insights there, a, a wonderful backstory about you know the boy genius who loved rugby league and made his way into the media from there and from there just exactly you know the career that Bevan has created for himself through putting people first, being curious and listening uh, to the advice of his mentors along the way. Uh, the next part of the conversation, we'll discuss Australia's response to the Bali bombings, uh, which Bevan was involved in, but we'll also look at Services Australia's detailed approach to both technology and communication strategy, and indeed the master plan that the agency has around its communication and engagement. But listen, I am delighted uh, that we've been able to make this a two-part series because, as you've seen already, Bevan has a lot to talk about as one of Australia's leading experts in government communication. So a great conversation, and I'm sure you'll enjoy part two. Uh, my name's David Pembroke. Thanks for joining me once again for GovComs, but for the moment, it's bye for now. You've been listening to the GovComs podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, be sure to rate and subscribe to stay up to date with our latest episodes.